Welcome back. Got another vid today. And uh, uh, nothing meant for any legal purposes. Talking about history, the past, information, knowledge, fiction, experience, all that good stuff. Uh, this one comes from my buddy Fabian. And basically, he's asking, you know, how do you breed for consistency? Meaning, you know, if you're uh, consistency and improvement. So on a scale of 1 to 10, let's say your, your dogs are at a 5 overall. Some are 1, 2, 3, 4. Some are 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Right? 10 is the highest mark, of course. You don't get a lot of those. And uh, you don't even get those consistently as far as, you know, if you're talking about great dogs like Tudor Blackjack Jr. or Grand Champion Art or Zebo or Queen of Hearts or Tornado like that. We all understand those are upper echelon dogs. They don't come around all the time, but you can get them. And, uh, you know, they're talked about being freaks of nature, the exception, all that, all that's true, but... It is possible, and with a good breeding program, sometimes you get more than one in your lifetime. But you have to look at the averages, you know. Something me and Frank Rocket talked about, you know, it's a question that came up. What if our average is above average to everybody else? So that would be one way of looking at it. And the way to get consistency, in my opinion anyways, and my experience, is to have a set of rules and follow them as closely as you can. Have some standards for your dogs. Now, the question, you know, or the, the it always comes up that, you know, you can't breed for superior dogs all the time, or you can't breed for uh, this type of, of uh of uh, consistency, higher consistency, better dogs, because it's a roll of the dice, it's chance, it's you never know what you're going to get, and all that, you know, and that that is true, but if that's how you're, where your focus is, thinking that, you know, I'm going to breed dogs, and there's no way that I can have that type of consistency, or there's no way I can only improve them so much, or you know, it's the luck of the draw and all that. that. That's not where the focus should be. Because it has been proven that you can have consistency. You can have better dogs. Your average doesn't have to be on the low end. It doesn't have to be just a bunch of plugs or uh, dogs that have a, a bunch of faults and some good things about them. You want to try to breed for dogs that have a lot of good things about them and some faults because they're always going to have some fault or lacking something right if it's something minor acceptable that's not a problem if it's something major you have to try and eliminate it as much as possible so when you look at it that way and you have a set of rules well what kind of rules are you talking about well to start off uh, proper maintenance, a proper setup, uh, good health, youth, vitality, spirit, good work ethic. When you start incorporating that, those types of things, that's what you're going to have. A bunch of healthy dogs with a, a good immune system, not prone to disease or ailments or like that. That, that would be kind of the first step. And then, you know, uh, with good work ethic, you can have ability, athleticism, intelligence, you know. And you kind of have to, you kind of have to not disregard, but not put the pedigree before the dog. Not make it where the pedigree is the most important thing. It's not. The dog is always the most important thing. And as you build your family of dogs, you're building your own pedigrees. So you should know everything about every one of those dogs uh, that you bred. 
and you should have a reason for keeping them and breeding them. If they're not deemed good enough, whether you keep them or sell them or give them away or spay and neuter, whatever you do with them, uh, don't breed them. Right? And people are always looking for that X factor. Well, you know, uh, you know, he might produce better than his brother. She might produce better than his sister. The sister might be an ace and she has all these abilities, but she don't produce nothing. That happens. Don't focus on her. But the only way to find that out is to breed them and see. And if you breed them, if you breed a male, let's say you breed a male to two sisters. You should find out, especially if the male is already a proven producer. But even if he's not, that's one way of finding out which sister produces better. Again, somebody's going to throw a wrench in, well, may not click with that, this and that. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about consistency. I'm talking about uh, if one produces better than the other with that male and it's your family of dogs, maybe with a different female, he produces better than that. That's not what you're looking for. What you're looking for is that particular, those two particular breedings. And you're trying to find out what they'll throw. Now, it may be you breed the sister that didn't throw that good with this one male. You breed her to another male. And she throws better dogs. But you would have to breed her sister to that other male to make that comparison also. Right? It can get, you know, mind-boggling. It can get stressful. It can get this and that. But I'm telling you, once you, once you get in that mode of breeding and uh, keeping dogs to your standard and breeding them and finding out which ones produce better or which ones produce the traits that you like, then that's where you start seeing the consistency. Because those individuals are throwing what they have and what their ancestors had and what they have and they're throwing it into their offspring. Right? You know, with, with superior dogs, you know, there, there's things thrown around like, well, Art never threw a dog as good as himself. Tornado didn't either. Zebo didn't either. That's acceptable because, or understandable, because that those are freaks of nature, right? But if they can throw consistently good dogs, Art threw a bunch of champions, he threw a bunch of winners, he threw Grand Champion Mike, he threw... Maybe those dogs weren't as good as him, but what he did throw was consistency. Bred to different females. Bred the stuff that he, he wasn't even close to how he was bred, and bred the stuff that was similar to him too. So you can't look at a, a dog like Zebo and expect to get dogs like Zebo if they are a freak of nature, if they are the exception. You're not looking for the exception. Sometimes they could. And then it's going to be up to you and everybody else to decide, hey, that dog was better than his sire. That female was better than her dam. This female produced better than Honey Bunch. If it hasn't happened, that's okay. Because what you want is that a, a daughter of Honey Bunch or a son of Honey Bunch, like Jeep, to throw consistently good dogs. And, uh, you know, I won't say any females off a of honey bunch right off the top of my head through consistently like her, even though several of her daughters produce good dogs, you know, like Polly, the, the uh, dam to grand champion outlaw, you know, or some of the other daughters of honey bunch you see out there, right? But her son did. Jeep, maybe he's a better producer than her maybe uh, by percentages and numbers he's not but he's up there with her as far as being a great producer and, and that's what you're looking for when when you're trying to up your game it's incremental it takes time it's generation after generation but what happens when you do that and you have several good dogs that came from several good dogs who came from several good dogs. That's your consistency. 
So it's just up to you to pick and choose which ones you want to breed and which ones you're going to follow. Because believe it or not, at some point, you're going to have a bunch of good ones that produce. That standard that's been proven has been proven by me. It's been proven by OTK. It's been proven by RF. been proven by TJ. Other, other breeders, you know, and, and they understand just like I did. You're always going to have dogs that throw dogs that aren't worthy, that aren't good enough for breeding, that didn't make the game and the, the grade. In my day, dogs that, that, uh, that quit, dogs that didn't have a lot of ability or the necessary tools to win. You don't focus on that. It's good to keep records so you know what's producing what and what you get out of what. But that's not what you concentrate. So when people say, you know, the, you, you get grand champions and champions and well-bred dogs that don't produce, that, that's just a given. You understand that. And you focus on the ones that, that do. But when you start trying to make these exceptions, like curs and cold dogs, you know, that have produced great dogs, this and that, you hear that all the time, right? That's not how you have consistency. Not long term. They've proven to produce great dogs. But what happened after that? Meaning, did they just take those exceptions and make it a rule? Well, I can breed almost any dog as long as it's well-bred. Because you never know what you're going to get. I can take almost any dog, whether it's cold or cur or have a bunch of faults, and I can get something out of it. That, that's not saying a lot. You could have a whole yard of junk, breed them. You're going to get good dogs every here and there, you know, every once in a while. But you're not going to have... A bunch of dogs that throw dogs that are worthy of competition. Dogs that are worthy of breeding over and over again. So I always looked at each particular litter. Since my dogs were basically all related. And, and I got competition dogs in almost every litter. If not every litter. Now I'm looking at which litter do I consider the best. The ones with the highest percentage. The ones with the highest numbers of competitors in it. And the, and, and the highest numbers that had not just one dog or two dog, but litter mates in there that were good. That you could win with. And then you breed them, see if they can throw. If they do, you continue in that frame. You continue with that. If they don't, you discard them. And some people get into, well, it skips a generation, that's true. And it may throw good with this female, but not with that one, that's true. But what I was looking for is whatever female I breed that male to, I'm going to get something out of it. Whatever I, ma male I breed to my female, I'm going to get something out of it. That's what I'm looking at. And then from there it goes to the highest percentage litters. So if you start with that, a litter that has... More than one or two dogs in it that turned out. That's what I looked at. Also, their parents, same standard, come from high percentage litters. High percentage for me means 50-50. At least half worked out, but half didn't. And then you have some where not even half worked out, and more of them didn't. And you have some that more than half worked out, and a couple didn't. So that's where I'm going with that. The ones at lowest percentage, I didn't follow those. Because in a, in a competition-wise frame of mind, you're thinking, well, these dogs can all win. They all have a win, one. And they all have different abilities and certain abilities that they share. So how do I pick which ones to breed to? Well, you breed the ones you like first, but... Again, the ones with the highest percentage, those are the ones I'm going with. And their parents were the same way, and the grandparents were the same way. So you start building your pets over generations, your own family of dogs, that's what you're going to see a lot of. A lot of dogs that worked out. And a lot of litters that worked out. But you're only going to choose certain ones. And those have to have particular traits that you admire that you want to retain above these other ones that worked out but don't have those particular traits 
So that's, that's to me, how you get consistency. People say you can't do it. And those, those, a lot of times those people that say that, they haven't tried doing what I'm talking about. They'll accept a dog with faults or they'll accept a cold dog because of how it's bred, not for what it can do. The whole basis of, of the American Pit Bull Terrier in the past was based on competition. Those were the dogs that people looked at. Those were the dogs that people followed. Those were the dogs that people bred. And were there other ones that were not competed with? A lot of them that weren't competed with that were bred? Yes. But you have to go through each and every one of them. Maybe that dog wasn't competed with, but his litter mates were. Or a litter mate that was, wasn't available or died or whatever. But they had the brother or the sister as a backup. And even in my own pets, I have that. I have some dogs that I didn't compete with. But generally, their litter mates were by me or someone else. You know, and there's certain reasons why you hold back on a dog and not competed with it back in the day. That's okay. But the consistency within the litter is still there. You know. And, and people, you know, another thing they try and do is... You know, it always comes up. What if I can't replace the dog or it's the last one of his line or the only one in the litter that worked out or, or you know, whatever reason they have for keeping it, right? First thing they're going to do is inbreed it, right? Well, that's one way of retaining those traits, but that's not the only way. You don't have to inbreed a dog to keep its traits, you can line breed it, you can outcross it and then bring it back. And line breed it. The pups after that. If you have a dog's influence. Whether it's heavy or light. On both sides of the pit. And you follow that dog's traits. Through his offspring. He doesn't have to appear there. 20-30 times. Because you're using the individuals. That exhibit the same traits. As that individual. Whether it's male or female. So you've captured it in his offspring or her offspring. And if you do the same thing on the bottom side of the pit, let's say the dog is a, a male. He's a, great, he's a grandfather on one side and a great-grandfather on the other side. If you followed the individuals after him and you captured his traits, his influence is on both sides of the pit, so you have it in the breeding that you're looking at now. Right? The other dogs in that, family are are a catalyst to get you to that point because you're choosing the ones that have his traits on both sides so it doesn't have to be inbred you know and there's a place for inbreeding but some people don't even try doing things different or thinking outside of the box but give an opinion on it. Just like saying, well, uh, you know, cold dogs produce. True. Have you ever tried not using a cold dog? Have you ever tried just wiping that from your pedigrees, wiping that from your family of dogs? Because at least you won't have that flaw if you do that. And if you do have it, it's going to come up every once in a while. Whether than you keep doing it and it becomes pronounced. And it could be any trait. Dog doesn't have good air. Yeah, but he does a lot of things good. I can improve on the air. You can. But how about not doing it in the first place? Not breeding him in the first place. There's no other dog you can breed to. There's nothing else that you can do. Because most pit bulls have good air. So when I had one or I saw one that didn't, that, that's a flaw. It shouldn't be in there. So I'm not going to keep it going by a dog that don't have good air. Some have better than others. But most of them have good air. It's in their DNA. It's part of their history to have that. So if there's one that doesn't, that is a flaw. It shouldn't be there. 
I'm not going to keep it going. It's hard to do. Why? Because the pedigree. Because who the siren dam are. Because he's off this dog and that dog. Because uh, he's inbred this. Or he's uh, line bred that. Or he's Jeep. Or he's Mayday. Or he, whatever it is. That, that should not be the first thought in your head. And keeping dogs because that's the last of their kind. And then inbreeding it. Well, at some point, it's going to be gone anyways. You're, you're not going to keep that going. Not by inbreeding it. You, you better off light, loose line breeding it, tight line breeding it, cross it, and then going back. If you want to keep that particular dog going. You know, after a while, the names change. The blood's the same. So you don't have to see some famous dog's name up close in your pedigree to say, I have his blood. You know, I've shown pictures of my dogs 30 years apart. Still look the same, act the same, same traits. They weren't bred by me. They were bred by someone else. But they knew enough about them to keep those traits going. They didn't lose the traits. And they're still there. So that fallacy of, of you know, you're going to lose it. If you don't keep it tight or you need it pure or like that, that's bullshit. It's never been true. And people haven't tried doing it the other way to make the comparison to say, they were right, I'm right, neither one of us is right, this works better, that works better. You have to do both. You have to see both. You can't just make a statement or give an opinion without some experience behind it. I can't say anything I'm saying if I haven't done it or I haven't seen others do it. But I'm not going to criticize somebody if I haven't done what they've done. Or admit, yeah, there's cur dogs behind my dogs. There's cold dogs behind there. What I'm saying is I don't have to repeat that pattern to have good dogs. I don't, I don't have to... Do what they did. I'm trying to be better than them. I'm trying to produce better dogs than them. I'm trying to improve the breed. Evolve with the breed. So some old standard or some old things that people did. You have to discard them. You have to not do them. But you have to try it first to see whether it works or not. And if traits are passed on, well... Dogs quitting is going to be passed on. Dogs being cold is going to be passed on. Dogs not having good air is going to be passed on. Dogs having brittle teeth is going to be passed on. Messed up structure is going to be passed on. Everything can. Color. Behavior. Temperament. You know. I had man biters. I know, knew how to handle them. I knew how to be around them. I knew how to protect my family from them. But they were too much of a liability. Because I came to realize, I don't care how good that dog is. I don't want that trait in my dogs. And if I can't breed dogs that don't have that trait, or the potential of throwing that trait, then I'm not a very good breeder. Some flaw like that, that's never an excuse for me anyways for keeping a dog. Oh, he's a badass. Well, so what? I had badasses that didn't do that. Same thing with a bad mother. Why would you keep her if she's a bad mother? She could potentially throw that. I'm just saying. That can't be the only female that you have. You can't love that blood so much that you're going to put up with that potential problem Generation after generation after generation. Question was put up. Dog only has one testicle in my group. Can it, can it produce? Yeah. Would you breed it? No. Nope. I wouldn't keep it. Why? Because it has the potential of producing that. And there's other factors that come along with it. The one testicle may be, be receded into the body. They're prone to getting cancer. They, that's a flaw, a health issue. That I wouldn't want to deal with. So I would eliminate it from my program. No matter how good the dog is. And back in the day I might compete with that dog. But I'm not going to breed it. You can't look at any dog. That this is going to be the greatest producer. In the history of bulldogs. 
might be. But that that's no way to look at it. That's the reason I'm not gonna I'm I'm gonna keep this dog because he has the potential to be something, but he has all these flaws in it in him or her. It's not good enough. Because like I said, you can breed for consistency. You can improve to a six from a five. So over time, now you've had these standards, you kept them, you've seen the improvement of your dogs from being average six to average average five to average six. Where do you go from there? Up. Now I want sevens. I want sevens, and I'm going to try to make the exceptions eight, nine, and ten. And you'll get it. Believe me, you'll get it. So that's that's how I would look at at uh, improving your dogs that are a five by having standards and following them and see how they play out. Use the ones that work and the ones that don't, don't use them. And keeping that consistency like that. A lot of it has to do with what I mentioned in the first place. Health, maintenance, vigor, vitality, youth. There's a school of thought, and this doesn't come from me, but I agree with it. It comes from many, many decades ago. Gameness is related to health, vitality, bone, Tolerance to pain, thick skin, things like that. Things that make a superior athlete superior, right? It's mental, of course. There's no doubt about it. What's in your heart is in your head. Same for a dog. But there's other factors involved. You can't expect a weak, spindly, sickly undernourished, mal malnourished, poorly treated, poorly maintained individual to be game. And even in those cases, there's exceptions to that. There have been dogs that under adverse circumstances, being wormy or sick or pukey or whatever, have proved to be game. But you can't expect that. There are exceptions. Just like that 10, number 10 dog, that superior athlete. They're exceptions. Most of them ain't going to do that, and you shouldn't expect them to do that. They should be not flea infested. They should be not wormy. They should be healthy with a high blood count. High immune system. A good immune system. Thick skin and hard muscle. Good bone, good teeth. All that stuff matters. And, and in my opinion, it does play a part in the what kind of gameness they're going to display. You know? So that's first and foremost. How you keep your dogs. You know? Uh, like I said in my other video, you know? They're confined to an area. You got to make sure the area is well taken care of. Because they can't get up and walk away from it. Whether something's airborne or birds shit in your bowls or you, you have, you know, parasites or bugs underneath the house or you don't clean their water bowl or food bowl, you know, uh, they're susceptible. So that's first and foremost, how you whelp your pups, what area are they in? Do you keep it clean? Do you prevent mastitis? Do you prevent infection? Do you prevent parasites? You know, there's stuff in the ground. The pups dig it up. Dogs dig it up. You know? You can go through. I not only spray Clorox, I turn the ground over in their spot twice a year. You know? And sprayed the shit out of it just in case something is in the ground. So at least I got... Six inches of clean dirt, you know, 
or it doesn't have something. And, and it proved, again, over time, unless you do certain things, you don't know. But it did prove over time I didn't get Parvo anymore. I didn't have tr problem with coronavirus, you know. And when other problems would have come up, if I'd have kept dogs, I'd have had to address them. What do I do about it? I do my research. How do I prevent this? What do I, you know, how can I make a, a, a more, <coughs> a more uh, a healthier area for them so all this stuff doesn't come in, you know? So that's first and foremost. Then, then you know, as you're raising your dogs, what kind of rules do you have? It could be a dog that's destructive. You don't want destructive dogs. Don't breed them because they're going to throw it. I had that problem with mine. So I tried to eliminate as much as I could. Is anything ever eliminated? No, but you can reduce it. And when those, you know, I'd rather have a, a game tough uh, dog that has a lot of ability and athleticism that wrecks its teeth uh, than a cold dog. I would. That's just me. I might be able to use the dog. I might be able to compete with it before all its teeth are broken. Uh, I might not breed it. But if I was going to breed it, I wouldn't breed it to a dog that's, to a female that's like that too, a destructive one. That's another way of kind of eliminating certain problems. Don't breed two timid dogs together. Don't breed two destructive dogs together. Don't breed two man biters together. Don't be, don't breed uh, do females that have prolapsed vagina. Don't breed females that are bad mothers. That don't take good care of their pups or kill their pups. I hate seeing with yeah, this, this bitch kills her pups, so we have to hand feed them from as soon as they're born. We got to pull them away from her. And, and it's not the work involved. That's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. But I don't want females like that. I get another one, a better one, doesn't have that problem. That, to me, defeats the whole purpose of motherhood. <laughs> a genocidal maniac that kills her children, it, it don't sit well with me, you know? And again, why would people keep that? Because the way she's bred. Because who she came off of. Because I can't replace her. You don't need to replace her with one like that, believe me. Get a different one, get a better one. If you're looking at the money, you know, I put a lot of money into this. Well, join the club. It's going to cost you. You ain't going to make no money. If you look at it as a business venture, okay, you want to hit that side? There ain't nobody I know, anybody in agriculture, livestock, or the businesses I've been around will keep a flaw like that. They, they wouldn't keep a chicken that only lays two eggs a week because of how it's bred. They wouldn't keep a bunch of bow-legged turkeys. They wouldn't keep hogs that don't grow over 40 pounds. I can't get up to over 100 pounds. They wouldn't do it. Not good business sense. You can't make money that way. So the same thing with a dog. You look at it as a business, why are you going to keep something like that? You know? Because you put all this money into it, now what? You're going to sell this dog with flaws to someone else? Okay, you got your money back or you made some money. What's going to happen after that? Word of mouth travels fast. Travels quick. People send me pictures all the time. This is what I got. This is how the, the dog looked when I got him. <coughs> Whether it's a puppy or a... You know, older than a puppy and they look like crap. Obviously wormy, obviously got skin problems, got some health issue. Okay, you got over on that person, whoever sold these people, those piece of shit dogs. But what do you think is going to happen? The word's going to get out. And it does. It does. Why? Because you wanted to save a few bucks or make a few bucks, get something back on your investment. People like that don't last. I'm just saying, if you do things the right way, try to be honest, have some integrity, that's going to follow you. You may lose some money. You may lose a lot of money on certain deals. 
you may buy a female, a pup, or a year old female, and she's barren. And you bought her to breed her. She don't throw pups. Well, you just got to assess that it's, if it's a puppy, of course the guy didn't know that she was barren when he sold her. If it's an older dog, then you got to question it. Did he do it on purpose? Who knows, but those are the kind of investments or a, you buy a pup and the testicles don't drop or whatever other flaw he has. It has a, a kidney problems or something they were born with, you know. You're going to lose money on that venture. Part of your dreams is not going to come true if you had high expectation, expectations for that pup. That happens. Right? Cut your losses. Focus on the ones that do. But when you keep that health in mind and that proper maintenance, proper food, athleticism, and all that in mind, and you breed those types of individuals, that's what you're going to start getting. A bunch of them like that. And it don't matter if you breed to this male, that male, this bitch, that bitch, this one, that one, all the ones you have in your yard, however many it is, whether you got two dogs or, you know, 10 dogs or 20 dogs, you know. In today's time, you can't have that many dogs. I understand that. <coughs> but if you have 10 dogs or less, there's no reason why all 10 of them could be good dogs and potentially good dogs. Because now it's just picking and choosing which ones throw the types of dogs you like. At some point, most of them, if not all of them, are going to throw you something. People say you can't do that. I don't know where they get it from. And I would guess they're getting it from people that told them that. And in their own breedings, that's what they're seeing. But that's just because they don't know how or they haven't tried to improve on that. They just accepted that that's what you get. You get a bunch of crap, and every once in a while you get a good dog. No, don't have to be that way. And it's been proven that it's not that way. But there's certain steps you have to take, and that health and all that stuff is important. And choosing the right individuals is important. After you do it long enough, you almost know what you're going to get. You at least know what to expect. And every once in a while, there's going to be a wrench thrown in the system. That litter didn't work out. This male can't throw. This female not a good mother. Or this female can't didn't throw nothing. Discard them. Take them out of your program. Because her sister, his brother, her <coughs> brother, his sister, their mama, their daddy, they did throw good dogs. That that that's how you see these guys breeders like Sorrels or or Carver or Tudor, whoever you want to say. That's how they had longevity. They knew how to breed dogs. But I would implore you to go back and see what you consider flaws or mistakes that they made and try and improve on those. That's where I always get that, you know, I wouldn't keep cold dogs or cur dogs like that. I just wouldn't. I see that as an improvement on mistakes made in the past, irregardless of some of them have thrown good dogs. Because the answer to that is, well, I have dogs that weren't cold and didn't quit, and they threw good dogs too. So that's where I see improvement. And in my opinion, once you start doing that, you're going to have that average boost up from a 5 to a 6. And if on the whole, everybody's average is 5, and over time, your average has improved to 6, it can only get better from that. But it takes time. And, uh, you know, that's about all I have to say. Thanks again, Fabian, my friend. It's a good topic. It's always going to de be debated. But anybody talking about certain things in the dogs, you know, it means more uh, when it comes from experience. Past experience is good and bad. Receipts, as they're called. And <clears throat> and what was produced results. People should be able to give you their results too. Not just make statements. Not just say what they think. And not everybody has done everything, including myself. 
but the more you've done and how you look at things inside outside front back side all around it gives you a better perspective of what it is you're looking at so thanks again my friend and uh, thanks everybody support push the like buttons thank you school baby <laughs> and thanks for your uh, uh, what do you call it uh, people that subscribe and all the merch that that's purchased all that is appreciated we'll keep it going more vids on the way and feel free to comment thank you